Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Liz Kao and myself for our lecture entitled Malnutrition and Upper Gut Cancer, which is part of the UCLA Esophageal Insights Zoom series. Neither Liz nor myself have any disclosures this evening. So Liz and I got to know each other through working with uh, esophageal cancer patients. Liz seeing them while they were undergoing radiation treatment and me and my outpatient GI nutrition team working with the patients both pre and post surgery. We were both really concerned by the amount of malnutrition we were seeing in this population and wanted to work together on protocols and best practices for helping these and other cancer patients. So with that being said, our objectives for tonight's lecture are ensuring a working knowledge of what malnutrition is and how to best assess and diagnose it, understanding how malnutrition affects specific cancer populations, specifically our upper gut cancers. And then we really wanted to focus in on our esophageal cancer patients and key considerations for maintaining nutrition status in this population and how important a multidisciplinary team is for ensuring that appropriate nutrition care is given to these patients. And one thing you'll notice throughout this lecture is that you'll see a blue circle icon, which you can see in the bottom right of our screen right now. This icon will be on slides where Liz and I believe there's a teachable moment. So where there's a possible gap in multidisciplinary care and where we believe better nutrition approaches could be practiced with our patients. So we hope that when you see this icon, it will draw your attention and hopefully lead to some key takeaways from this lecture. And with that being said, I will pass the mic over to Liz who will educate us on the ins and outs of malnutrition. Thank you, Nancy. So we wanted to briefly go over some malnutrition terms, starting off with malnutrition itself. Um, it's most simply defined as any nutritional imbalance, but there are other working definitions which discuss malnutrition as occurring along a continuum from inadequate intake or increased requirements, impaired absorption, altered transport, and altered nutrient utilization. The next few terms outline some manifestations of malnutrition as it progresses. So we have cachexia, also known as the wasting disorder, which is defined as ongoing loss of skeletal muscle mass. And this can be with or without loss of fat mass. Um, sarcopenia is the loss of lean muscle mass and declining physical function. And lastly, frailty is an increase in someone's vulnerability to developing um, increased dependency or mortality when exposed to a stressor. And it's really associated with poor health outcomes, including increased disability and admissions to hospital and care homes. It's also more common with increasing age. So numbers project that it affects about 25% of people above the age of 85. And so in regards to these terms, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap. One key feature of malnutrition is that it may or may not be associated with cachexia. You can have sarcopenia without cachexia, but with cachexia, you have sarcopenia. So you'll see that there's a lot of interplay between these terms. So we've come to our first clinic tip where we'd like to mention that malnutrition does not mean that a person is underweight. Um, it's really important to note that sarcopenia occurs in overweight and obese patients, and it really does undermine their physical um, function while retaining that appearance of obesity. And so this does make sarcopenia a bit difficult and challenging to detect in the growing population of overweight and obese cancer patients, but it's really especially important to assess lean muscle mass in overweight patients who are often overlooked as having malnutrition. So touching base on some methods to assess lean muscle mass, um, unfortunately, there's no gold standard for measuring body composition in patients with obesity. Um, and as such, there's pros and cons with the following tools described here. So we have bioelectrical impedance tools. They are relatively inexpensive compared to the other devices listed here, but they do have questionable validity um, in very obese patients, especially those with weight loss. DEXA scans and MRIs, they're easy to use. They have high accuracy. Um, but morbidly obese patients typically won't fit into that field of view. And these, these machines usually max out typically around 300 to 400 pounds. 
CT scans performed on patients prior to radiation therapy also have weight limitations and 3D photonic scanning is easy to use. They can accommodate higher weights, but they aren't widely available or utilized. So lastly, here on this list is the nutrition focused physical exam. And this can be a whole session in and of itself. NFPEs are what dietitians use to support diagnosing for malnutrition. A major drawback is that it is subjective, um, but it is easily accessible. And as a dietitian, it allows us to follow a patient along the course of their treatment and have tools to really assess for malnutrition. So physical signs of malnutrition can be identified in um, patients who are obese. And there are three regions in the upper body which may be helpful to assess for lean muscle. So you can inspect and palpate the temporal muscle, the clavicles, and the shoulder muscles to really assess for signs of muscle depletion. Um, because these muscle groups of the upper body are more small, or they're smaller in size and typically have less overlying fat than the lower body muscles, they're more likely to exhibit these earlier signs of wasting. So this next slide might seem a little dense, but we'll break it down clinically for you in a few slides. In 2011, Ken Fearon and colleagues came up with this international consensus definition for cancer cachexia. And so as you can see in this image, they've staged three phases of cachexia. And in the first two stages, you have the percent weight loss outlined. The most important takeaway from this is that some malnutrition or cachexia can be reversible and some cannot. And we really need to know where our patient is at on this spectrum. So in this consensus, they outline the first two phases can be reversed. It's in that last phase, the refractory stage, where losses can be fully reversed, even with conventional nutrition support. And this leads to progressive functional impairment. And so this really emphasizes the role as healthcare practitioners and even dietitians to intervene and help with halting the progression to the refractory stage. In this bottom image, they outline some recommendations for management under each phase. So in precachexia, there's a focus on monitoring and preventative intervention. So you'll have, for example, a nutrition consult. In the next phase, cachexia, the focus is on management of those reversible factors. So you'll have maybe physical therapy interventions, nutrition support, and perhaps medications as well. In that last stage, the refractory stage, there's a focus on symptom palliation, psychosocial support, and really weighing the risks and the benefits of um, nutrition support. So you'd see a lot more of those aggressive interventions in the cachexia phase and less in the refractory stage. Okay, so we've come to our second clinic tip where we'd like to emphasize that there is a point of no return for malnutrition. It's really important to be aware of where your patient is at on the spectrum, know how to look and assess for malnutrition, and know that it's not only weight that matters, but it's the type of weight that matters most. And we know that malnutrition may be masked by fluid accumulation, and that's a key indicator of nutrition deficiency and active inflammation, even if there's no overt weight loss. So act in early stages by sending referrals to nutrition and really emphasizing weight maintenance and adequate intake to your patients from the beginning. All right, so now let's dive into the diagnosis and assessment of malnutrition. But before we get into the slide, don't get too caught up on the image on the right. This is our diagnosing criteria we use as dietitians, and we wanted to share this with you. Um, we use it to determine the type of malnutrition that we're working with, whether it's acute, chronic, or starvation environmental related. So how do we diagnose and assess this? In recent years, there's been a lot of effort to better standardize and define malnutrition. In 2012, the Aspen and the AND released their consensus statement to define it. And we know that malnutrition is multifactorial. Um, because of this, there's no single parameter used um, to define it, which is why the identification of two or more of the six characteristics listed below is recommended for diagnosis. So it's really important to note that these characteristics recommended, they are a work in progress. It's not unlikely that as we collect more data about these characteristics and about malnutrition, that these things may change or modify. So as UCLA dietitians, we're using the ASPEN and the AND criteria we discussed. Um, this is a snapshot of what you would see for a patient under the chronic illness category. The moderate and severe criteria here utilize the ASPEN criteria. And I want you to notice that our weight loss here is based on the percentage of weight loss and not pounds. 
And so these percentages start at 5% in one month and work its way up to 7.5% in three months, 10% in six months, and 20% in 12 months. The moderate and severe category is where you see more of those aggressive nutrition interventions. And notice that there is ICD-10 codes attached to these, which means that we can bill. Um, if there is mild malnutrition, the intervention may not be as strong, but this is mainly for our surveillance purposes because we know that patients can really jump forward to severe during their treatment course. For our third clinic tip, we wanted to go over some nutrition screening tools um, to use. And so the American College of Surgeons developed their Strong for Surgery Nutrition Screening Checklist. There are a few concerns we want to bring up in utilizing this as a nutrition screening tool, particularly for the outpatient, the ambulatory setting. Um, so remember in the last slide, we talked about malnutrition diagnosis. We were speaking about weight loss in terms of percentages, not pounds. So you'll notice here that the second question on this list asks you, has the, person, has the patient had unintentional weight loss of over eight pounds in the last three months? So imagine that we have a patient who's 280 pounds and a patient who is 120 pounds. Both of them have 10 pounds of weight loss. This would trigger 4% weight loss for the 280 pound person, putting them in that mild malnutrition category, and then 8% for that 120 pound person, which would put them in that severe malnutrition category. You know, obviously there are other characteristics we look at when we, de we determine the diagnosis. So it's not that the percentage is a guarantee for mild or severe, um, but when you look at the pounds, it doesn't really clearly capture what this weight loss looks like for that person, which is why it's really critical to look at the percent weight loss. Second, the question of, is the patient unable to take food orally? It's a bit extreme, right? So a nutrition screening checklist should target patients prior to needs for aggressive interventions and prior to a patient being unable to take food orally at all. And then lastly, as a reminder, there isn't one single parameter used to define malnutrition and no single lab test for it. And so here, you know, albumin may predict surgery outcomes, but we want to remind you and to keep in mind that it's not diagnostic for malnutrition. Um, studies have found that in prolonged protein energy restriction, there's really no correlation between albumin and weight loss. We know that as albumin increases, um, the inflammation decreases, regardless of how much protein is consumed. So because of this relationship to inflammation, we don't really consider it a good indicator of nutrition status. Um, it can help reflect the acuity of illness, but not necessarily the presence or severity of malnutrition. And so this nutrition screening checklist is a good start. But when it comes to screening for malnutrition in the outpatient setting, we're really looking to utilize better tools. When looking at nutrition screening tools to use, we rely on validated tools to triage people into intervention. At the Robert G. Kardashian Clinic, we use a malnutrition universal screening tool, the MUST tool, which assesses BMI, percent weight loss, and acute disease effect score. So it has these three steps, and you simply add up the amount, or you can use the online calculator in that link below. Um, if you get any value above zero, this will trigger a referral to nutrition. And ideally, this should be performed um, on initial assessment and repeated regularly. And the great thing is that all staff are able to use this from RNs to physicians. Um, this is a tool that you can use to assess for malnutrition and find your patients who are more at risk. So to make sure that you can catch it, you want to use the dot screen for malnutrition smart phrase to pull up this table into your chart. But if you find that the must tool seems too time consuming, which is fine, um, if there's one takeaway from this, we'd like you to figure out step number two, the percentage. So you take the amount of weight, weight loss um, divided by their starting weight and multiply that by 100. Because we see it in your notes, right? Patient has lost 20 pounds of weight in three months or you know, 60 pounds of weight in six months. But when you calculate the percentage, this helps us as dietitians to capture the severity of their weight loss and will also help you get a picture of what this means for your patient. So now that we've looked at malnutrition, let's really hone in and dial it into cancer and malnutrition. So we know that it is widely prevalent in our oncology population, but just how often does malnutrition occur in cancer patients? So these are some numbers on your patient population. Studies show as many as 80% of upper GI and up to 60% of lung cancer patients experience significant weight loss at time of diagnosis. And we know that malnutrition is widely prevalent during treatment course. 
Additional support suggests 50 to 80% of patients are cachectic at some point during care. And so these percentages are really scary. This means that eight out of 10 of our GI patients will fit this definition. So I want you to take a moment to reflect on your patient population and ask yourself if this is true based on your clinical experience. So looking at the prevalence of malnutrition across oncology patients, a recent prospective observational study conducted at 22 medical oncology centers across Italy looked at just over 1900 patients and their weight changes leading up to their first medical oncology visit. They found that an overwhelming number of participants had that significant weight loss with over 60% losing between five to 10% and greater than 10% of their body weight at the time of their first visit. They stratified patients into two groups, non-metastatic and metastatic disease, and as suspected, they found um, higher severity of malnutrition in advanced stages of cancer. And so patients with the highest frequency of malnutrition were those with esophageal, pancreatic, head and neck, and lung tumors. As you can see here in this um, image, those with metastatic disease were twice to almost four times more likely to have that overt malnutrition at time of diagnosis. When researchers looked at criteria for cachexia, and this they defined as a weight loss of greater than 5% or a combination of a BMI less than 20 with weight loss of two to 5%, they found that more than 70% of pancreatic and gastroesophageal cancer patients and more than 60% of liver, colorectal, GI tract, more than 40% of lung, head and neck, and genital urinary patients could be classified as cachectic. So the study really highlights the prevalence of malnutrition in these populations, and even prior to starting anti-cancer treatment, which we know anti-cancer treatment in and of itself can have significant side effects on nutrition intake and nutrition status. So now I'll pass it on to Nancy. So as Liz just showed us, these are all of our patients who are being affected in huge numbers by malnutrition. So those of us who work with cancer patients, these are our patients. And not only is malnutrition negatively impacting their physical health, but as this chart clearly demonstrates, it's affecting treatment course, complication rates, cost, and leading to poorer quality of life for our patients. And really it leads to more problems for us as their healthcare providers and for the healthcare system at large. Malnutrition has been shown to lead to increased hospital stays, increased calls to the doctor, longer treatment delays, and increased risk of complications. So for example, Loss of lean body mass has been seen to be associated with higher toxicity from chemo radiation, for chemotherapy. And this means reduced tolerance and possibly reduced response from the, the chemotherapy treatment. And so this is likely to lead to more calls to the doctor and more patient complaints of side effects. We've also seen that loss of lean body mass leads to poorer outcomes with healing from surgery and more likelihood of post-operative complications. Research shows that this costs the healthcare system millions of dollars each year. And because this lecture is for the Robert G. Kardashian Esophageal Center, Liz and I wanted to focus the rest of this lecture on our esophageal cancer patients. So let's start with pre-surgery. Pre-surgery, there is considerable issues with weight loss and malnutrition in this patient population, as seen in the research listed on this slide. Severe involuntary weight loss of greater than 10%, which Liz just showed us is one of the markers of severe malnutrition, is very common in this cohort, and if not resolved before surgery, can lead to decreased mortality post-surgery. So as you can imagine, having a dietitian as part of the interdisciplinary team has been shown in research to reduce many of the complications and issues we saw with increased malnutrition on the past slide. And this is actually a chart that I really like. It's from a review article that was in the Journal of Thoracic Surgery in 2019 called Preoperative Nutrition Optimization of Esophageal Cancer Patients. And this chart is really looking at what are some key things that could be done before surgery to help with better outcomes after surgery for this patient population. And I'm not going to go through this whole chart, but a couple key takeaways is that the earlier we intervene, the better. 
So starting at the time of diagnosis to check for malnutrition and assess nutrient needs is one way that we can make sure our patients fare better throughout their course of treatment. And this really means that everyone in the multidisciplinary team needs to be involved in checking on nutrition status and malnutrition. It also emphasizes the importance of both adequate calories and adequate protein. And we're gonna dive deeper into that in just a few slides. But before we do, I just wanted to show you what we do at our center to try and address multidisciplinary care for malnutrition. Our plan starts at the time of diagnosis to help manage malnutrition as early as possible and stave off unnecessary weight and muscle losses in our patients. This is why seeing a dietitian is encouraged several times during the patient's treatment course. And this really helps to keep the whole uh, team engaged in how the patient is doing nutritionally. So what exactly is it that we do for these patients? So of course, as dietitians, we're looking at micro and macronutrients to help optimize healing and recovery. And this is where I wanna stop for just a second and talk about how important it is to be looking at calories and protein in this patient population. The needs of cancer patients are significantly elevated compared to non-cancer patients. So let's take an example of a 50-year-old man who weighs 170 pounds and is a height of 5'11". And if he's modestly active, he likely needs somewhere around 1,900 calories a day and 95 grams of protein. If this same person was then diagnosed with esophageal cancer, his caloric needs could automatically go up to 2,300 calories just because of how we know cancer affects the body. And if this person then became malnourished, his needs could easily go over 3,000 calories per day. His protein needs will likely be 120 grams. So you can see that as a dietitian, our job is not only to assess and assure that the patient is getting adequate calories and protein, but we also work with the patient to make sure they're taking in forms of protein that are easiest for the body to break down and utilize so that they are able to rebuild any lean body mass losses and any wasting from malnutrition. And actually, this is something that I find to be quite a large stumbling block for a lot of my patients, as well as for some of our doctors. So this is my first clinic tip. It's very common when I meet a new esophageal cancer patient for the first time, and I ask them, what are they trying to do to help with weight gain? They often say things like, oh, I'm trying to eat more ice cream or cookies. I'm adding butter to everything. I'm eating some French fries. And this is either something that they've come up with on their own or maybe their family is trying to help them with, but sometimes it's also that their provider told them to do this. So if they choose to eat these high fat and refined carbohydrates, the number may go up on the scale, but this is not necessarily the way that we want our patients to gain weight. For one thing, remember that weight and BMI are only two measures used to assess nutrition status, and they are incomplete when looked at alone. So one thing that I like to do for my patients is I like to ask them where their weight is going, especially since we can't do a nutrition focused exam at this point in time. And so one thing that we'll do, can people please mute themselves? Thank you. So one thing that I'll ask them is where do you notice that that weight is going? Does it seem like it's going to your midsection and the waist of your pants are getting tighter? Are the arm sleeves and pant legs getting, getting tighter? Are you noticing that your face is filling out or have family and friends noted that your collarbones are less exposed? This can actually help us to understand where the patient is trying to gain weight and where the weight is going to. Because we know if the patient takes in excess fat and carbohydrates, it's most likely go to go to visceral abdominal fat. So not only is this not increasing their lean body mass, but it's increase, increasing insulin issues and this is not good for surgical outcomes. So when in doubt, if you have a patient asking you best practices for trying to gain weight, offer them a high calorie, high protein shake or protein water, whether pre-made or homemade. And Liz will go into this in more detail in a few slides. So what about after surgery? 
So all of our patients are on jade tube feeding for at least two weeks post-surgery, which can be really helpful, not only for healing and recovering from surgery, but to also stave off any further weight loss. Because if we're not careful, these patients who we just worked so hard to stave off weight loss and malnutrition in pre-surgery, they can actually lose that pre-surgery weight very quickly post-surgery if we're not careful. So again, this is another place where the whole team needs to be involved in nutrition care. And we're very fortunate, fortunate at UCLA to have really great inpatient GI dietitians who help to optimize the micro and macronutrients and, uh, for our patients, as well as minimize any side effects from their enteral nutrition. And for an outpatient dietitian like myself, the real work really begins about two weeks after surgery, when the patient might be cleared to start oral feedings. This can be a little bit of a complicated back and forth issue where it requires a lot of communication between the surgeon, the dietitian, and the patient to assure that tolerance of the oral intake is achieved and that we are staving off any symptoms that they might have. So as we work on returning a patient to PO intake, we always start with clears. And this really is just to make sure that the new anatomy is functioning properly and ready for oral intake. And we move our patients very quickly from clear liquids onto full liquids. And full liquids is where patients can actually start to get some of that protein and calories that they really are gonna need. And as we're able, we move them onto a soft diet. And this is when we can really start considering reducing the tube feed. So if a patient is underweight or malnourished, clearly we're not going to stop the tube feeding while we're bringing back oral intake because we want to make sure we get them to a healthy weight and a healthy status before we discontinue the tube feeding. If a patient has been maintaining their weight well, then we can teach them that for every oral protein shake they're able to take in, which are usually about 250 calories and 15 grams of protein, we're able to remove one can of tube feeding formula. So this is one way that we help to teach our patients about how they can do the transition from tube feeding into oral intake. And we also want to give some general recommendations to our patients. So one thing I think is really important and that I've noticed patients are really grateful to understand is ways that their new anatomy could be affecting their ability to eat as well as symptoms. So most of the patients that I see have gone through um, the Ivor Lewis esophagectomy. And so I always talk with my patients about the fact that they have a smaller gastric pouch, which means that they're not able to take in as much food at a time. If they do, they're more likely to have early satiety and even regurgitation and reflux. So we encourage eating smaller, more frequent meals anywhere between four to eight per day, depending on their tolerance level. And we also remind them that they no longer have a lower esophageal sphincter or LES. And this was that connection point between the esophagus and the stomach that helped gravity to do its work and keep the contents of the stomach in the stomach and not be refluxed back into the esophagus. So we let patients know that they need to limit the amount of fluids that they have per meal because not only do we not want to overfill the pouch, but also if they overfill the pouch, some of that content is going to come back up on them and not make them feel good. And we don't want to displace parts of the stomach that could have been used to house food with fluid. So we encourage them to just sip at meals if they need help to get the food to go down, but otherwise to drink their liquids between meals. And we want to make these, these liquids as nutrient dense as possible. So this is where they might do a protein shake or a protein water. And then we also talk about um, how lying flat because they don't have that sphincter means they're much more likely to have uh, reflux or even possibly aspiration. And gradually, as the patient is able to tolerate it, we can progress to slightly larger portions. And then we also, of course, want to work on managing symptoms. So you can see some of the common symptoms that we see in this patient population. And depending on what they're experiencing, we may have to talk with them about dumping syndrome and how to adequately balance their meals. Or we may have to talk with them about lifestyle changes for things like regurgitation. So a common complaint I get is that every time the patient bends over, they notice that they have regurgitation. And I remind them that if you bend at the waist, you have no sphincter to stop that food from now entering the new esophagus. And so what we need to do is bend to pick up stuff from the ground, not 
or sorry, squat down using our knees, not bend over at the waist to pick objects up. Also, we talk about ways to stave off nausea, which Liz will talk about more in a little bit, but we may talk about limiting fat at a meal or even using carbohydrates before a meal to kind of settle the stomach. And then we can also talk about ways to help with diarrhea, such as non-viscous forms of fiber supplements, because if we use a viscous form, it's not going to be easy to swallow and it might not be well tolerated. So we don't want to put that pressure on the new anatomy. So we can only use a non-viscous form, or we may even go for something like an oral rehydration solution. So these are examples of some of the handouts that are given to our patients before surgery. So we actually like them to have all of this information before they ever step foot in the operating room. So they have an idea of what's going to be coming after they get out of surgery once they're cleared for oral intake. We like to work with the patients on what liquids and solids will be um, allowed and even encourage them to stock up before surgery so that they're ready to go as soon as the all clear to start PO intake is given. And not only does this seem to reduce stress for our patients, but it gives their caregivers a lot of peace of mind. And so we really load them up with lots of tips and brands, meal ideas, grocery lists, and this really seems to give them a lot of confidence. So this is one way that we like to take care of our patients. Great. So yes, we know that a majority of these patients will go through neoadjuvant therapy. And we know that individuals receiving these multimodal forms of therapy are at very high risk. So um, up to 80% of them will experience unintentional weight loss and malnutrition during their treatment course. Um, studies have shown that individualized nutrition counseling for cancer patients undergoing radiation therapy is associated with improvements in nutrition intake, weight, and quality of life. And so oftentimes I'll meet with a head and neck or GI patient who's new to oncology treatment and they'll say things like, you know, I've never been able to reach my goal weight of 180 pounds, you know, it would be great to lose a few pounds during this. Um, if a patient is overweight or obese and going through, let's say, breast cancer treatment, we may discuss these healthy intentional weight losses. However, for our GI cancer patients, I always stress the importance of weight maintenance. And this is because we know that treatment for these conditions um, can create some very challenging side effects like oral pain, dysphagia, which contribute to unintentional weight loss. Um, and we know that this can create an irreversible situation and contributes to increased symptoms and treatment intolerance like Nancy had mentioned. So our nutrition goals during treatment um, first off, to maintain their weight, and we do this either through uh, we do this through weekly weight checks and weekly assessments for high risk patients. Second, to encourage adequate nutrition intake, and this is through high calorie and high protein intake. And the goals are individualized for each patient. Um, third, to improve their quality of life through management of those nutrition impact symptoms, and fourth, to support treatment tolerance. So. Chemotherapy um, guidelines suggest that a patient needs about 85% of their original prescribed dosages to achieve the best control. So the overarching goal of oncology nutrition is really to tolerate prescribed treatment with no breaks, no delays, and no dose reductions. And so the effects of chemotherapy and radiation, especially to the esophagus, can be astronomical. Um, nutrition impact symptoms are symptoms and complications of not only cancer, but anti-cancer treatment or medical comorbidities that can really interfere with someone's appetite and ability to digest or eat food. And so some of the common nutrition impact symptoms from radiation and chemotherapy um, to the esophagus are listed here. So what are some quick things that you can tell your patient before they get to a dietitian? Um, we tend to focus on calories, but with these high risk patients, as Nancy had mentioned, it's equally important to stress high protein intake. Amino acids are really the building blocks for cell recovery and lean muscle preservation. And so as dietitians, you know, we always advocate for a food first approach. Um, before dishing out any oral supplements like Boost or Premier Protein, first ask your patient, can you make a homemade protein shake once a day? And this can be as simple as a milk, maybe Greek yogurt or nut butter, maybe some banana, and maybe even a protein powder. If a patient is really struggling to meet needs with whole food sources, 
Um, something to consider for your patient is to recommend a clean and unflavored protein powder so that they can add it not only to their smoothies, but to savory things like soups, um, mashed potatoes, oatmeal, any beverages, whatever they can tolerate. Um, with head and neck cancer patients undergoing radiation therapy, we have a protocol of initiating exclusive oral nutrition supplementation if they lose 5% of their weight from their treatment start. Um, and we found that this really does help to reduce the rate of G2 placements during treatment for that population. If a patient is struggling with persistent nausea, you can encourage bland carbohydrates on an empty stomach. Um, this can help really settle those sensations in their stomach. So for example, like a handful of rice checks or maybe a piece of toast or saltines. Um, if a person is having nausea in the daytime, when they wake up, I'll have them do that first thing in the morning to kind of get ahead of the nausea. Um, if they are able to, as Nancy had mentioned, to separate drinking liquids from meals can help with that as well. With taste changes, uh, my go-to is this fat, acid, salt, and sweet chart. This was developed by a culinary chef working with individuals going through cancer treatment. And I've really found this useful for those people who experience taste changes, especially with chemotherapy, which can make not only food, but also water really unpalatable. Um, so if someone is telling you that, you know, water tastes briny or just tastes really funky or bitter, have them add maple syrup to their water, which can really cut out those off tastes and make it palatable for them again. We, you know, we don't want to use too much acid, such as lemon with a patient who has mucositis, but if they don't have any mouth sores, adding a squeeze of lemon can really cut out saltiness or adding some olive oil or sugar to foods can tone down spicy tastes that they may be getting from food that doesn't even have any spice in them. So in closing, you know, we know that malnutrition is widely prevalent in our populations, especially our esophageal cancer patients. And we know that it can severely affect treatment outcomes and quality of life. So hopefully from this, you understand what malnutrition is, how prevalent it is in our patients, and that you as a practitioner play a critical role in catching it. So it is a multifactorial syndrome that requires early intervention and multimodal management. So by no means is this something for physicians, oncologists, surgeons to take on alone. It really does take a team to tackle malnutrition. And as dietitians, we rely on consults and referrals, but we also rely on utilizing validated tools to screen patients and triage them into intervention. So that's why we've incorporated items like the MUST tool so that you as providers or anyone from nurses to MAs to physicians can catch malnutrition in its early stages and refer them to us. It's really in this identifying in the early stages and referring to other experts. So not only dietitians, but other support services like physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, um, that is really imperative to effectively treat malnutrition in the oncology patient. And for our clinical tip takeaways, a reminder that malnutrition does not mean underweight, that it is possible for even our overweight and obese patients to experience sarcopenic obesity. And this is where we really wanna keep an eye on lean muscle losses in these patients, as Liz described earlier. Also, we wanna act as soon as possible with these patients, because remember that there's a spectrum of malnutrition and there is a point of no return. So the earlier we intervene, the better. Also, albumin may be a good marker for surgery, but it's not a good marker for nutrition status. So we don't wanna use that for malnutrition. Instead, we wanna use validated tools like the MUST screening tool. And if you're with us at UCLA and you're using the EPIC system, please feel free to use the dot screen for malnutrition smart phrase. If you're having any trouble utilizing it, just let Liz or I know and we're happy to help you. Also, trying to calculate percent weight loss instead of just looking at pounds of weight loss is a much better marker. So remember, all you have to do is divide the pounds lost by the starting weight and multiply by 100. And if you're even willing to put that in your note before you send your patient on to a dietitian, we'll find it from there and we'll be able to then really help those patients. Also, um, we want to make sure we're not just thinking about weight, we want to think about the type of weight. So remember that a patient can um, gain weight because of fluid accumulation, which is a part of malnutrition. And this can actually um, be a sign of active inflammation and even possible nutrient deficiencies. So we want to make sure we're using comprehensive screening tools and not just looking at the amount of weight loss or gain because it may not be accurate. 
Also, whenever possible, prioritize protein and calories over fat and carbohydrates. So offer your patients protein sources for weight gain instead of things like ice cream and french fries. And then, of course, that fat, acid, salt, and sweet chart that Liz showed is wonderful for navigating taste changes, especially since we know that this can lead to um, appetite changes and weight loss. And so if we can offer our patients tiny tips and tricks to encourage better intake, this is really useful and helpful to them. So we hope that this lecture was useful. Um, and if you've been convinced that having a dietitian as part of your care team would be helpful, here are some ways that you can refer your patients. So dietitians right now um, are, at least we are um, only doing telemedicine at this point in time, um, but the insurance and billing rates are the same as they were for in-clinic sessions. And amazingly at UCLA, for patients who are undergoing radiation treatment, they can see Liz as part of therapy, which I think is just amazing. So no prior authorization is required, and you can see the phone number on the screen, but we'll show you on, on the next slide um, if you're part of UCLA, a really easy way that you can make this referral. And then if you would like uh, your patient to see an outpatient GI dietitian, um, I work with two other wonderful dietitians. We're normally housed in Century City, Santa Monica, and Westwood. Um, and you can see the CPT codes that are used to verify insurance, so either patients can call their insurance company and give these CPT codes to find out if nutrition services would be covered or our staff can help them with that. And then we also have the out-of-pocket fees. And this is a great um, external referrals tool that was recently created um, for patients to be able to be referred to Liz. Liz, do you want to give a little bit more detail about this new tool? Yes, so previously um, referrals to the Radonc Radiation Oncology Dietitian were limited to nurses and physicians within clinic, um, but thanks to our amazing IT team, it's now live for providers from external clinics to refer if a patient is anticipated to go through radiation therapy. And so right here, you would click on the external referral link, and then you'd follow the same pathway listed in this image. Um, this is really a great tool to utilize so that we can catch patients prior to starting radiation treatment and kind of go over some of those nutrition um, tidbits and, and full assessments prior to their start. So we just want to say thank you so much for joining us this evening.